This is Derwood Shepard, the Standard Plans Publication Engineer with the Roadway Design Office here in Central Office. Um, welcome this morning and we'll go ahead and, and get started. The agenda for the, the training today, just a little quick overview of the Standard Plans website, of the errata process, revision history log. I have a quick presentation or a quick slide on the uh, FDOT design manual. And then from there, we'll start going into some of the individual standard plans updates. Uh, I'll be joined by Richard Stepp, Ed Cashman, and Cheryl Hudson from the Structures Design Office. So for the website, there's not a lot of major changes this cycle. You know, after we did our transition from design standards to standard plans, we redeveloped the site to kind of uh, make it a little bit more of a central area to access both the standard plans and previous versions of design standards along with uh, some of the support documentation. One thing I do want to point out is the under the support information, the CAD files, if you click on this link, it will always take you to the current version of the standard plans and those associated DGN. You can see if once navigating to the actual standard plan site, this is where we're going to start populating year after year new versions of the standard plans. And as you can see, the 2019 2020 version is now active. So if you wanted to access older versions of CAD files or cells, you would have to go into the individual year. And that was one thing I wanted to point out. Once you navigate into the standard plans year version that you're looking for, you know, it's just generally the same look and feel that it's had for a number of years, even under the design standard. Individual indexes are, are accessible through this link as well as um, the entire ebook for the standard plans for road construction. Um, you know, we, we started an errata process a couple of years ago. I always like to point that out during this training just to let people know that when we make fairly insignificant or typographical errors that we don't want to have to wait an entire cycle to correct, we'll go ahead and, and make those edits and post them, and if that type of change has occurred, those erratas will appear on the website in this column. Revision log. Uh, this is another topic that I always like to bring up just because the vast majority of some of the changes that occur from one cycle to the next, if you have questions about where something went or uh, you know what type of change occurred within a certain index, the revision log is always the best place to start. Um, it's the best place to start if you're you're having to do a plans update for a project to go from one version of the standards to the next. This is this is the best place to start for that, so you know what sort of items within the index has changed, and you can account for those within your plans update. The FDOT design manual. Um, you know we we post the majority of the department's major publications, especially relating to design at the same time every year, November 1st. And along with that is the FDOT design manual, which commonly has a lot of similar changes or, or changes that occur within our standard plans also result in a change to the, the FDM. They will be providing training coming up very soon. An announcement will be sent out via contact mailer and uh, once those webinars are available for the various FDM chapters, they will appear on the website um, in this area shown on the screen. One thing uh, that we added to the FDM last year with the first release was a new chapter 115 as it relates to the standard plans and standard specifications. You know, if you want more information about interim revisions or errata or any of the general processes, including developmentals, that is the chapter within the FDM to go to to find additional information about the different processes that are used within the standard plan. So from here, I'm just going to go through what I kind of tagged as some of the miscellaneous indexes that uh, we made changes to this cycle. And uh, we'll just step by step go through some of these um, small changes. Starting with the miscellaneous earthwork details, this was Included in the 000 section of the standard plans, which is the the kind of group that doesn't necessarily tie with any specific specifications. Or when we made our initial shift from design standards to standard plans, 
um, we didn't have a clear path for where some of these indexes might fall, so they got numbered starting with zero, zero, zero. The miscellaneous earthwork details, we took another look at this cycle and decided to start breaking it up and, and assign it a little bit better index number. So within this index, the majority of the details had to do with stabilization within the medians. And so the primary content here got re-indexed to 160-001. And then there was one detail on this index dealing with excess base material removal. And it was previously referenced within index 120-001. And since it kind of deals with, uh, you know, embankment use around the, the roadbed, uh, it made a good fit to relocate that information within that index. So here's just a quick look at index 160. Again, the majority of those details had to do with stabilization, so it made a good fit to re-index it to match with specification 160. Embankment utilization standard plan index 120-001 is where we relocated the excess base material information. And then we also did some general uh, layout adjustments within this index to kind of make it match up with the current formatting that we're using for the roadway standard plan, as well as bringing it up to date with, with new CAD standards. So we, we, aside from just bringing in the excess base material, we, we updated the index and the general notes. One other change to index 120.001 was the removal of the Treated permeable base option, which is previously sheet two. The department has moved in a direction of no longer having treated permeable base as an option for rigid pavement. And as referenced in the rigid pavement design manual, currently only asphalt base or special select soils is shown. So real quickly, we'll go on to some of the super elevation indexes. These indexes will still be in the 000 range because super elevation can obviously apply to several different pavement types that are covered by several different specifications. But one change we did wanna make this year is removal of some of the redundant information that is included within the FDM. And in some cases, there was a little bit of conflicting information, especially as we shifted towards some of the new complete streets policy related to super elevation rates. And so, the information in here, which was specifically design information related to determining super elevation rates, was deleted and it's already and was previously included in FDM 210.9. One other change to the high speed super elevations index was the addition of a concrete pavement note. This information was covered in the FDM previously, however, as it relates to concrete pavement, and the break point along the shoulder line is different than when we use flexible pavement, and we wanted to make sure that that information was clearly communicated to the contractor in the event that some of these details of the shoulder break point aren't real clear in the plan. So for the low speed roadway super elevation, it's the same exact situation with removal of FDM information um, relating to the super elevation rate. Now, one of the major changes that involves some significant changes between the FDM and the standard plane that I'm going to cover this morning has to do with the turnouts and driveways chap or indexes, uh, both what was previously index 515 and 516 under the design standards. So the main issue with these indexes had to deal with, uh, you know, one of the the changes that we've been making through a lot of standard plans recently, which is trying to remove criteria information and the standard plans be purely a construction document. And so as it relates to the turnouts and driveways index, there was a vast majority of this index included design criteria for the driveways, including, for example, geometric requirements, you know, the connection with flare distances, uh, radius and setback requirements. And so that information, along with some of the definitions that were included within the index, 
such as connection category types, application types. You know, previously we covered uh, what the definitions of the different profile types were under the alphanumeric codes. And a lot of that information will now be explained in the FDM. There was also a lot of information included within the index that was describing some of the differences between maintenance's responsibility with driveways and the permittee of a driveway or the owner of a driveway. And a lot of this information is already included in the Florida Administrative Code Rule 1496 for state highway connection permits. And that's another place where there was some redundancy within the, the standard and the rule document, and those didn't necessarily match up in all cases. And so that was removed so it would allow the rule document to stand on its own. So again, the majority of the criteria information has been moved to a new chapter within the FDM, Chapter 214. And as also mentioned before, there will be a new webinar series posted for the FDM changes and a new webinar for Chapter 214 will be posted very soon. And then as a result of moving a lot of this information around, we, we ended up creating two new indexes to cover the primary issues that were covered under 515 and 516 previously. And so that, that's been broken up between concrete driveways, which is, which is paid for and covered under specification 522. And then the other part of it would be paved or graded driveways, which we realign with specification 330, which is kind of a, a miscellaneous pavement index. And there's not necessarily any, any payment associated with that because again, this could be a paved or graded driveway, or it could be a concrete driveway that just on a flush shoulder or has radial return. So we kind of generically just placed it in 330 for better alignment. So just that as an example, looking at old index turnouts and driveway standard plan index 000515, you can see here the vast majority of the information on sheet one was all criteria information moved to the new chapter 214. An example here of sheet six was where we had a lot of information about maintenance responsibilities and what part of the, the driveway maintenance was responsible for and which areas they weren't. And again, that's covered in rule 1496. And then one of the, the final sheets within the old index that had primarily criteria information was sheet seven, which had all the turnout profile information. So just real quickly look at some of the, the sheets of the new concrete flare driveways. And again, we, we pulled all the information that was, that was previously related to purely concrete turnouts and and put that within 522, which is the specification with which these would be paid for and the workmanship would be done under for construction. So this sheet is primarily uh, includes content from what was sheet two of old design standard index 515. We reformatted it to resemble a lot what you would see in index 522.002 for curb ramps. And we included a nomenclature drawing similar to that the curb ramps index to kind of define the terms used with either within this this index or within the specification. Sheet two covers the different layout configurations that you would see depending on the offset of the sidewalk from the curb line. One thing that wasn't really addressed that well previously for concrete driveways was the flare of the sidewalk around the driveway. And so we included two different options now, option A and option B, where you could either match the flare of the driveway itself, which is, is option A, or option B, where you just apply a 45 degree angle with a four foot minimum sidewalk. We didn't include any specific requirements for when to use one versus the other. It was just to provide some flexibility and and actually play some specific requirements for what those flares are to look like. And then the other plan views included on this sheet are again, just covering the options that were previously covered in index 515. This one for utility strips equal to or greater than 10 feet wide, 
And then finally, the one for utility strips less than 10 feet wide. The rest of the index just includes the alphanumeric identified typical driveway profiles that were previously included in index 515. So continuing on, uh, as I said, the, the majority of the information from the turnouts and driveways indexes was moved to the FDM and the new indexes were created. The second of those indexes was a new paved and graded driveways index, 330-001. The majority of this, uh, this information was from sheets five of 515 and from index 516. The majority of this information is just as it was presented in the previous index with some modifications to the notes to remove some of the construction phase uh, decision making and, and, and make it work a little bit more uh, cleanly. Sheet two, um, you'll see that it looks a lot like the previous design standard index 516 with a couple of modifications to really bring some of the new construction and resurfacing project information together into one document. And we updated the cross sections along the right side of the index, as you can see here, um, some of the call out for base material and, and the surface and friction courses was a little outdated, so we updated those. One of the primary changes was the addition of what you see here is detail A, which is the friction course transition. Previously, as you can see here, we just called it out as a one foot feathering of the friction course. However, that wasn't always all that practical and you'd end up with raveling of the friction course if you tried to take it down all the way to basically you know, zero. So we worked with the pavement uh, section here at RDO and we changed that transition to just provide a quarter inch drop off at the end of the transition. So real quickly, just a few more indexes that I'll cover, one of them being the concrete pavement joint index 350-001. Uh, the primary change here was just simply deleting the key joint option within the index, uh, which we were finding out wasn't being used all that often. Index 522-001 for concrete sidewalks. We made some minor adjustments here for clarification of primarily when to apply expansion joints. And the, the primary question was beginning to become when to, or if expansion joints were required when the, when the sidewalk met up with the back of curb inlet. So within the example shown on the index, we updated them and the note A about expansion joints to make it more clear that it is required for inlets. So a quick look here at the new index you can see that we switched out some of the driveway options in the examples to actually sew curb inlets and call out the type A expansion joint. We also did a little bit of cleanup of specification 522 because there was a lot of redundant information dealing with the joints. And so 522 was, was a, lo a lot of information will be deleted out of that specification since the joints are handled here on the index. And like I said, we revised the note for the joint type A so that it was more clear that it would be required between all types of fixed objects. Um, and that language is a little bit confusing with the way the specification was written previously. Index 522.002 for detectable warnings. Made a few minor adjustments to this index again. On sheet one, we updated note C uh, the old language on the index referred to not allowing warps or varying slopes within the ramp and to keep it all on a single linear plane. However, that's not always practical, especially if you're trying to chase a grade along the mainline roadway. So more practical approach is the new language that we applied to Note C, which is just telling the contractor to maintain a single longitudinal slope along each side of the curb ramp, and that allows the ramp to match up with variations in roadway grade. On sheet two, we made some modifications to CRA and CRV alphanumerics for the curb ramp types. These changes were primarily done just to allow the index to work with the uh, 
the the sidewalk width requirements that are now included in FDM chapter 222 along with the changes for complete streets and uh, which you know provided for wider sidewalks in some of the contact zones and this index still had a lot of reference to uh, five foot minimum sidewalks or had sidewalk width that really didn't match up with what our criteria shows as the sidewalk width should be. So in some cases, you know, we realize that these curb ramps will still match up with, with sidewalk widths of maybe five feet on existing projects or new sidewalks of 10 foot. So what we really try to do was just, you know, these Plan views are intended to be an example showing what the width could be, but more so establishing what the minimum requirements are for cross slope and width within the ramp itself. And so there's always going to be some variation to these plan views in the, in the actual plan set anyway. Um, but so we just updated these to not be so strict on stating that certain sidewalk work width for minimum. Um, that might conflict with the FDM. On sheet four, we added an option to the CRE type of curb ramp, and this was really just to kind of draw attention to the fact that in a lot of cases where the sidewalk might have some significant setback from the back of curb, that the best curb ramp option is more likely to be the CRE type, where we've, we've kind of seen a trend where we were seeing more of the CRA type of curb ramp in an application where it really, really didn't fit. And so we just wanted to draw attention to that. So we created a separate option showing it with a, not just a uh, perpendicular sidewalk, but actually with a parallel sidewalk to the curb, just at a, a larger offset. On sheet six, we, we made some adjustments to the pavement relief detail. Uh, this primarily had to do with some of the allowable ADA slope differentials and the fact that in some cases you might actually have to remove part of the gutter lip to maintain a maximum 5% slope and not introduce a, a break point greater than allowed under ADA. And so we just updated this detail for pavement re relief to actually show the new surface of the curb ramp on the roadside to be lining up with the gutter line of the curb instead of matching the top of the initial pavement surface. One final change on this index was adding some curb transition details that were previously included in the turnouts and driveways index. Um, but basically it was just showing some minimum details for how to, how to terminate or transition a a curb beyond a curb ramp, and so we just relocated that information on type on sheet eight. Uh, final comment here will be about some of the some miscellaneous traffic control signals and devices indexes. Um, I don't have a lot of detail here, but uh, these indexes, including the conduit installation details, aerial interconnect, pool and spice boxes, span wire mounting sign details, vehicle loop installation details, and cabinet installation details. All of these indexes received um, kind of a general update to them. No, no design changes or, or content changes. We just updated these index. The, the rest of the 600 series had already received updates to the, the CAD details to match current CAD standards um, or updating the layout to match current um, layout design policy. And we did some note consolidation, but for the most part, these indexes, it was just kind of a, what I would refer to as a refresh, not much of a change in terms of content, but I just wanted to make sure y'all are aware. And from here, I think Ed's been handling a few of the questions uh, that have been coming in on the questions pane. Um, looking at the time, I think I'll go ahead and hand it off to Richard Stepp, and he'll cover some of the changes, the concrete barrier and guardrail for this cycle. Okay, my name is Richard Stepp. I'm a standard plans engineer, uh, central office up here in Tallahassee, uh, where it's cold. And I held the primary responsibility for updating uh, the following indexes, 
uh, guardrail, concrete barrier, uh, opaque visual barrier, and then uh, some of the crash cushion details. And so some of them are just uh, smaller changes. Some of them are complete redevelopment. And so I'll go ahead and walk you through them right now. Uh, so the first index is guardrail, where we've added, uh, a, basically updated our trailing anchorage uh, from what we had been using for the past couple of decades. And then there's also updated downstream placement policy. And so the first thing to start off with is sheet nine, uh, basically no more type two. And so I think we had that probably for the last uh, two decades. So anytime you were trying to put something on the trailing end of guardrail, you'd call out the type two and everybody kind of knew what that meant. Uh, but going forward, we now have a new kind um, that we're just no longer going to use that, that terminology for it. Uh, so basically, the soil plate anchorage system has been removed. Uh, some rectangular washers have been removed. And then as far as additional things that have been added, this is the new trailing anchorage. And so we have a new strut system. we got two struts total, uh, one on each side. Uh, that takes the place of that soil plate. Uh, we also have that post two, the new short timber breakaway post. Um, and then another tube foundation helps secure that a little bit better for mash. And so these changes basically follow the latest design uh, for MASH uh, following discussions we had with a Midwest roadside safety facility. And then so on sheet 10, just to kind of support that, we added the detail for the ground struts. Uh, and we deepened the steel tube post foundation, again, for our discussion uh, with the research facility. Um, and so to kind of tip off the contractors uh, that there is a change because they've been building these things so long, they might not even look at the drawings anymore. Um, we went ahead and changed the pay item just to kind of let them know uh, something different. Uh, so now all the type two have been removed, as you can see, 25 and 28. And then if you look at the BOE, uh, we've added in uh, the pay item, uh, basically uh, 20 and 29. So there's, there is a change there. And then the BOE, it lets you know when it's effective. Uh, so that's helpful. So pay item change on trailing anchorages. And then one other concept. Uh, and talking with uh, the research facility was that, and looking at their reports, is that uh, we have a new policy for basically placing the trailing anchorage. Uh, used to extend basically one post spacing uh, downstream of the hazard. Uh, now it goes four post spacings. And so they actually had done a lot of crash testing research on it and modeling. And it turns out that in order to develop this ribbon strength, you need to extend downstream of the hazard so that your vehicle gets captured uh, upon impact going right to left here. I don't know if you guys can see the bottom of the screen. That's, I think that I heard that was an issue, but, um, so basically, you know, in order to ensure you capture the vehicle, it doesn't just penetrate through uh, and go to the hazard. You need to extend that downstream. And so this shows up in part C of our new standard plans instructions. We explained the new policy. And then also if you use the, uh, the, the new length of need Excel sheet, um, it's going to show you that extension in the drawing uh, automatically so you know it's there. And if you actually use it, its stationing capabilities and you input your hazard in the right location, it'll automatically extend that downstream for you. So it's handled in multiple places to let you know. And that's all we have for guardrail. So now we'll move on to concrete barrier. And so we've got a new barrier mounted sign support option that's got uh, dual supports. Uh, we have space constraints. Uh, we have a new call out for variable section width, uh, the pay item for that, and we'll show you how that works. And then we have a new wall shielding barrier and some taper rates for, uh, for concrete barrier. And so showing you a sheet eight now, this is a, a new sheet. We had a similar concept to this in years past, and we never really dropped the concept, but it wasn't drawn this way in the standard. And we had questions about it, so we went ahead and just and just redrew it and added another sheet uh, to show you what happens um, when you basically add a dual support on top of the barrier and don't increase the width of the barrier at the gutter line. So the barrier basically stays two feet wide the whole way. You have no type of shoulder reduction. And so this would be used um, where you have a limited uh, space and if the designer wants to handle it this way, this would be a project specific design. Um, so we went ahead and uh, added that option in. And um, I think in the future, uh, the structures office may actually provide um, some support uh, with helping to design uh, the project specific designs for these still upright. So you can stay tuned for that. Um, 
so then moving on, uh, there's this concept called variable section width uh, that we didn't have in prior years. Um, but now what's happening is we're attempting to capture our cost more accurately. And so when you have a simple barrier section that's like 38 inch height symmetrical medium barrier, that's very consistent. So you can capture linear foot cost uh, very accurately for that. And then short grade separated, tall grade separated, they're all, they're all pretty consistent. Um, but the thing that was throwing off costs and then future estimates was that we, we do have these more complex segments, uh, we call them variable section width segments that are all very project specific. And so in order to not kind of, um, you know, disturb these, these nice estimates here, uh, we went ahead and came up with a new pay item called variable section width. And the DOE, it explains what they apply to. I'll just go ahead and show you some drawings on those because it's easier to see when we show you drawings. And so basically that's what you need to know is there's a pay item for variable section width. And for double face, you would use the median barrier version. And then for single face, you use the shoulder concrete barrier version. So it's a variable section width. And again, it tells you in the DOE what it's used for. And so to make um, it a little more evident to designers, where the limits of that pay item are. Uh, we went ahead and put in the standard plans drawings what the limits would be. So I'll just show you some examples of that. So um, here would be our sign support. Uh, this, this would be the larger sign support that's mounted atop the barrier. You can see the barrier gets much thicker, gets much taller. Um, it's not, wouldn't, wouldn't be the consistent linear foot cost with the 38 inch medium barrier over here. And so for that, we use a different pay item. So we went ahead and put this in the standard plan drawing so you can see the begin variable uh, section station width and the end of it. And then similarly for the, this is the new uh, dual upright. Um, the same concept applies because this section is much different than the standard section. And so this one, it's not quite as easy to grasp the concept because the gutter line stays the same two feet wide. However, we still call it variable section width because the top of the barrier does get wider and it does get taller. It's basically non-standard. And in case there's any confusion, we just went ahead and called out in the drawings where the variable section was stationing in. And so another example is the split barriers uh, that go around the sign support pedestal. Um, all of this together is just considered one linear foot pad and cost. And I use this as an example to explain for simplicity, the linear foot measurement of this would just go along the center line, even if there's uh, dual sections, it's just one pay item and it just runs along the center line. This is usually symmetrical and pretty linear, so it should be uh, easy to handle that way. And again, we called it, we called out the start and stop points. Um, one other example is for shielding a pier. And this one, again, you can see this is all just variable, not standard shape. This is all highly project specific, depending on the width of your pier. And so you can see where we would call out uh, the different type of pay item here for variable section width. And then last but not least, um, this is a new wall shielding barrier. So it's a little sneak preview. Uh, so there you can see the retaining wall is here. Um, this would be a standard section, but then you have the variable section width called out where this is all very project specific in order to handle that overhead sign support. And so this is an example of a single face version that would be the shoulder a barrier a pay item version of that. And so now moving on, we got the wall shielding barrier. And so this is uh, some new drawings and kind of a new concept that we've now standardized for us. Um, but it's not really a new concept for the state of Florida. Uh, we're showing here past examples, and I want to point out these are non-standard because in the past, uh, we really didn't have drawings showing this configuration of uh, the flush mount, kind of a half section barrier. Um, we didn't explain how to handle, um, you know, the, the joint behind it or anything like that. Um, but designers were still electing this, uh, project specific designs, they were electing to do this. And it did make, it does make sense um, in certain locations. And why you might want to consider it is uh, for just basic overall crash worthiness of the system. Um, some of the MSC walls, uh, maybe, you know, they're vertical faces in general, but they may be less than ideal um, if their smoothness, um, you, you know, is, is not the best. So, you know, the one at the bottom of the screen here looks like it has a pretty roughened surface uh, with a lot of ridges. Uh, you'd expect uh, that this would snag on a vehicle uh, more so than some of the smoother walls and then certainly the barrier itself. And so to add some crash worthiness, 
uh, it is beneficial. And then another effect of that uh, is is to provide a little bit of, of protection uh, for the MSC wall itself. Um, and so what's happening is the MSC walls tend to be, uh, you know, a lot more costly uh, than a simple barrier. And so it's almost just like putting in a sacrificial uh, layer of concrete between the vehicles and the wall itself. So that may help prevent um, some maintenance costs. Uh, you know, if the MSC wall takes a hard hit, uh, may require a panel replacement, and that could get costly and, and more complex rather than just having to replace a simple barrier. And so you have some added benefit um, of helping to shield the MSC wall, uh, whether it really needs it structurally or not. And so now getting into uh, the usage decision. So we're leaving it as it has been in the past, where it really is kind of just a project-specific um, district-level decision. And we're kind of happy where we've been seeing it in the past, you know, um, to not uh, really give, um, you know, really prescript uh, guidance on it. It's been showing up uh, per engineering judgment uh, as the districts request it uh, in areas where we would want to see it. And so now we're just kind of providing some support for it uh, with our drawings. And so the space required um, for the simple case, which is what we're showing here, uh, this is just basically the flush mount, uh, the most simple version of this. Uh, it's one foot, three and a half inches. And basically that accounts for uh, the, the barrier section itself and then a half inch preform joint filler behind it. And so that would be the added space uh, you need on your project to add a little bit of shielding. Um, now, again, looking at past examples, um, which we now provide some drawings for in terms of how to handle it, um, we now have the, the tapering of the barrier, which kind of tapers away from that MSC wall uh, at, different, at different rates. In this case, it's for an overhead sign support to go around it. And so you can see kind of on the approach end, this is a gradual taper rate. Uh, roadside design guide provides guidance on this, and now we will too moving forward. And then on the trailing end, um, in order to save space, uh, this is kind of a steeper uh, taper rate. Uh, which makes sense because you're not quite as concerned as vehicles getting snagged on on the trailing side. And so I'll show you some of those tapers coming up as well. And then here are the drawings again to support that. You can see we have the detail. And so basically this is this overhead sign support would be a project specific design uh, depending on the size you need. And then we provide drawings showing the minimum dimensions all around it in relation to the barrier, in relation to the retaining wall, and then how to handle the backfill and all those other things. And so we have drawings set up for that. And as I was talking about before, uh, these are project specific tapers, which I'll show you on upcoming slides where on the approach side, traffic moving right to left, it's more shallow. And then on the trailing side, it's steeper. And that, that also saves a significant cost uh, with backfill of concrete or flowable fill um, by making these as steep as possible. And then so another uh, item configuration we've seen out there is connecting the guardrail. So uh, you may be using guardrail as an effective approach treatment where you put an approach terminal here, uh, or it could just be a convenient way to continue on with the barrier on the downstream end. And so we went ahead and, and uh, gave some details for that. So you can see here we're connecting to guardrail. And this particular scheme then requires a minimum of five foot, three and a half inches, um, basically to, to attach the guardrail and allow uh, enough setback distance for deflection and all of that. And so we went ahead and detailed that out. Uh, we explained how to, how to terminate uh, kind of the backfill wall with some extra reinforcing for contractors and things like that. And again, this overhead sign support uh, for connecting the guardrail, I mean, this may or may not even be here, but we're showing you just an example of how it would fall into things uh, with the dimensioning around it uh, should you have to use a project-specific sign support behind it. And so now another version of this, if you have very limited space and you're trying to mount an overhead sign support atop a barrier, um, this now has the sign support directly atop. And so you're not placing it behind the barrier anymore. And in this case, you're tapering out to the full width you need on the approach. And this would be the project specific taper and then tapering back on the trailing end. Um, and the space needed for this is project specific depending on the overall width required uh, for that support. 
And so now moving into these papers, this is a new concept for barrier in general that we're introducing. Um, it's been in the roadside design guide for a while. We're basically using the same type of policy, uh, but now we went ahead and included it in our standard plans instructions because it's a good policy uh, for certain circumstances. So the median barrier is consistently 1 to 20. Uh, nothing really has changed here. This is the way the standard uh, plans drawings have always shown it. Uh, typically, median barriers are limited access facilities where you have plenty of space. For simplicity, we keep everything symmetrical. Um, and for the design, it works out nicely. You could have possible contraflow and things like that, so we're just keeping it simple. Um, but then where you tend to have limited space, and this is a newer policy, is the shoulder barriers. Uh, typically, you know, urban areas, you really want to maximize the space you're using. And for that case, we actually have paper rates that correspond to design speeds. And so the taper rate is basically the lateral offset per unit length. Um, and that the lateral offset is measured from you know, parallel to the roadway. So uh, for example, you know, the one to 16, 55 miles per hour would be um, you know, for every 16 feet longitudinally, you go over one foot laterally. So that's how that works. And then on the trailing end, um, they're all simply one to five, uh, we're not quite as concerned with snagging on the trailing end, so that's more simple, and it saves you some space. And then, so here's the picture of how these relate. So that, that would be the approach end with the direction of traffic uh, coming from right to left. And here are the values, and they, uh, for, for this particular one, uh, you'd be using the shoulder barrier value, so you can adjust it based on design speed, and that can be a project-specific design, saving some space. Uh, trailing end would be downstream, assuming traffic's coming right uh, to left, and that's typically one to five. Okay, so we've wrapped up concrete barrier and move on to opaque visual barrier. So for this index, we redeveloped an index sheet for clarity. Um, from start to finish, we've added some design improvements for durability uh, and varying barrier heights as well. We handle that now. And there's a new SPI and SEM section uh, to provide some background explanation on that. And so here is an example of the previous standard for opaque visual barrier. <clears throat> so you guys can see uh, kind of what we're talking about. So it's basically preventing uh, headlight glare. Uh, you know, very uh, typically these are installed, um, you know, very metropolitan areas, uh, high population. Uh, I think this, these photos are from Palm Beach. Uh, District 4, they have like 12 to 14 lane I-95 down there. And so it makes sense the way the designers uh, have chosen to use this. And so in the past, we didn't uh, have uh, any type of really prescript usage policy. And moving forward, uh, we're going to stay with that. We have added some more guidance and to add some awareness that this option exists. Um, but we do like to leave it a little bit open in terms of allowing the uh, districts to use this at their discretion. Uh, at that level, um, because where we've seen this being used in the past, despite no clear guidance for it, um, is in the heavily populated areas, like I said, South Florida, uh, Jacksonville, Tampa, you know, the really large highways. And the whole idea is if you have lots and lots of lanes of traffic and, you know, vehicles trying to change lanes and, and make, uh, you know, maneuvers among lots of other vehicles, it helps if they're not looking at, you know, six rows of headlights coming at them. It's one less distraction uh, results in safer driving. And so, you know, these really urban areas, uh, they are pretty cost effective. And so we've added this to the FDM uh, just to kind of raise awareness that this option exists and, and provide a little bit of guidance. It remains a project specific district level decision. Um, basically consider it for limited access facilities that with glare issues, uh, high traffic volumes, uh, separation between opposing traffic lanes, uh, 26 feet or less. So that's you know, the, the two shoulder width plus the two foot barrier. And then one limitation that we did add is that we don't want to see this being installed on overhangs, uh, drop offs like on bridge railings. Um, so anytime there could be somebody in harm's way on the back side beneath it, uh, like over a waterway, over a roadway, uh, we simply don't want it to be installed because opaque visual barriers are yielding design when it gets impacted and it could fall. And so now we're, we're basically saying that you have to have four feet of shoulder uh, to either side of the opaque visual barrier. And so now that kind of limits it. So now there's no drop off 
In addition to that, with the yielding design, when it's impacted, there could possibly be some debris. And the four feet just gives some room for the larger piece of material to fall to the shoulder without impacting traffic. Um, kind of the energy can dissipate a little bit. So that's just a, a little bit of a buffer um, that, that helps with safety. And so here are our new drawings. So the notes where we've written for clarity, we've added note headings uh, to help people quickly find the information they're looking for. And now we're handling the new single slope barrier shape. We show specific drawings for that. Um, because the new single slope barrier is a little bit taller, the overall panel has actually gotten a little bit shorter, which is good for durability. And the overall height is 60 inches. And that's also true for the old F shape. And so we still support the old F shape. There's a lot of that existing in the field. Um, if you're doing a, a new project and you have old barrier in place and you want to add some glare screen to it, uh, you can go ahead and install it to the F shape and we have details that cover that. Uh, one other improvement we made is the web is now six inch spacing. Um, uh, in the past, it was almost two feet. So the whole idea is to prevent, uh, to, to kind of lessen the size of any impact debris, uh, should there be a severe impact. Um, and then the other uh, design improvement uh, is joint spacing. Basically, we're requiring that the panels are at least 20 feet long. Um, there's only one installation issue we've ever really seen in the past in one particular district where there was a maintenance issue because if these things got uh, bumped by vehicles, they might start leaning. And I think it was discovered that the cause was that these panels are very short. And so when a dowel spacing is three feet, you'd only engage one or two dowels per panel. And so to fix that, we now have a minimum panel length that engages plenty of dowels and also add some weight to it. And so any of the districts that had longer panels, there was never really an issue. So they had been performing nicely in the past uh, when designed that way. Uh, so now sheet two, we've handled some different uh, configurations, uh, maintaining the 60 inch opaque visual barrier height. Uh, we show a case where we have the barrier that's raising up for a large overhead sign support to 56 inches. And we basically show the termination of the opaque visual barrier um, panels. And so that's handled now. And the designer, roadway designer, doesn't really have to think about that um, due to the next concept. So we have a concept now, which is explained, um, the notes on sheet one, and then the STI, and even the specifications, it's called a leave out. So when you're putting in opaque visual barrier, you can just detail it as one continuous line, even if it's a mile long. If you have any interruptions, pretty much for overhead sign supports or light supports that are barrier mounted or, you know, a brief pauses in the barrier. You don't have to stop and start your length measurement. Um, a leave out up to 15 feet is permitted with one continuous pad and measurement. And so that kind of helps out the designers keep things simple. And so that would be, this would be a large example of a leave out. We have a large overhead sign support, but you could have a lot smaller ones as well. And then one other thing we cover is when you have variable barrier heights, uh, we just handle this for the contractor so the roadway designer doesn't have to think about it as much. Uh, if the barrier is raising up taller uh, to shield the pier or something like that, uh, the opaque visual barrier just continues right over it with the same height, and we show the details of how the panel itself gets shorter. And we also have uh, SPI that's been redeveloped, so it covers uh, crash worthiness design limitations. Uh, one thing I just wanted to read out for you guys are these design limitations for crashworthiness. Uh, so roadway designers don't get the wrong idea about it. But basically we say a fake visual barrier is only intended for use as a visual screen. It's designed to withstand wind loading, light debris, minor contact from vehicles, uh, errant vehicles. It's not intended to resist or shield against errant vehicle impact loads. So it's basically designed to yield if it gets hit by a serious vehicle strike and then let the barrier itself, you know, the concrete barrier do its job. And so don't really install a take visual barrier thinking you're going to be shielding a pier with it because that's not how it works. It's, it's designed to yield. It's just designed for a visual screen. Um, so we also explain some general placement practices uh, for split sections, which side to put it on, uh, call out locations, and then some pay item information for opaque visual barrier. And then with that, we're finished with the OVB. Um, so moving on to our crash cushion details. Uh, this is our last index I'm going to talk about. So we've redeveloped some index sheets 
uh, the SPI for clarity on the crash cushion, and we've redeveloped a uh, summary of permanent crash cushion table. All these things uh, hopefully increase understanding, make things a little more simple to use, and then we have a few new pay items for that, so I'll just walk you through those. And so one thing to mention is index 544001, crash cushion details, is designed for permanent crash cushions. Uh, temporary crash cushions is a different topic. Uh, the SPI for this uh, even tells you uh, where to look for a temporary crash cushion. And so drawings and notes redeveloped. Uh, length of need process has been simplified, which I'll explain. Uh, we've also simplified the table and the pay items. And so we've got basically three concepts. Um, first concept to talk about, it's kind of new, is it a crash cushion call out point right here. Uh, basically, this would be like your old station location, uh, how you identify where your crash cushion is, is now the same as the length of need location. And so it's, it creates a more simple process where the crash cushion just kind of extends um, downstream of the traffic. So it's the same as the length of need location. It's also the same as the begin end guardrail station or the begin end concrete station. So all these things now align uh, for simplicity. And then now looking at the length of need design tool, uh, this would be the drawing in the Excel sheet. I'll just reiterate the same concept. So you got your traffic coming right to left, your departure line, um, and that's kind of your length of need point. So your crash cushion station is right at the length of need point. It's right at the beginning end of you know, the concrete barrier, the guardrail, whatever you're connecting to. So that measurement is the same. They don't overlap for simplicity. And then also, you know, as I was saying, um, your connecting barrier. It's all the same point, all aligned. And then, so the second concept is now kind of what happens, um, I guess, downstream on the approach side of the point we were just talking about. And so that's called the length of end treatment. And so that's a kind of a simplified process that we came up with. It's similar to guardrail approach terminal uh, concept. And it basically includes all proprietary elements required per the APL drawings. And, you know, that can even include a manufacturer's transition as this thing. If you look at the APL drawings, uh, they could require additional guardrail and they'll show where you're gonna to connect to the standard guardrail in the APL drawings. That's mostly for the contractor to be concerned with, but regardless of what's required on the APL drawing, the designer can just assume uh, this length of end treatment includes everything. And so what the designer needs to know is the default length for this in order to accommodate the contractor's choice of all different crash cushion types is 27 feet, six inches. So if you use that length, uh, it will then accommodate the contractor to use anything that's on the current APL. And we even have um, in development some CAD tools with the DNC manager. Uh, basically next month will be released where uh, if you select the crash cushion, it'll automatically have a cell that's 27 feet, six inches long, and you can just basically click it, attach it to the end of the barrier you're connecting to. And then that, you know, you can use that to determine whether or not you have enough space for it. And if you don't have enough space for it, uh, we have, some other alternative options you guys can do, which I'll explain in a minute. Uh, okay, so the third concept, uh, getting a little bit more detail, but this is the last one. Um, basically now we're on sheet two of that index. So here's all the similar things we just showed you, length of end treatment. Here we have this parallel segment, which you have to know is basically from a design perspective, it's always parallel to the road and it's always 21 feet, 10 and a half inches long. So we got 21 feet, 10 and a half inches. And that's always going to be required. Uh, the contractor may switch up the configuration. We have notes and the standard plans to explain to them when they need to use this configuration, when they don't. From a design perspective, you always need to have that link there that's parallel to the roadway. And one place that could come into play is where you have connection to dual bridges. You're trying to minimize your length of your guardrail with the crossover configuration. And so you got this parallel link. And that parallel link right there happens to be exactly 21 foot, 10 and a half inches. That's the default in the Excel sheet. So that's a nice benefit of using the Excel sheet. It's just ready to go and the note explains where it came from. And so you can see how all these, all these concepts align. So that's a parallel segment, uh, 21 feet, uh, 0.9 inch, uh, 21.9 feet. And then, so to read it one more time, we got the reminders of this whole layout. So we have our 21 foot, 10 and a half that's required. 
Um, then you have your begin and guardrail station, crash cushion station, link the need point at the end of that. And one other thing I'm going to point out is that this is the begin and guardrail station measurement. And then everything to the right side of it is just considered standard guardrail as a pay item. All this is included. Uh, the specification will explain that. And then the last thing is the length of end treatment is this portion here. So you got all the different portions, everything now aligns nicely. So this is a good resource to look at when doing your design. Um, now we have the SPI, we've redeveloped it. Uh, these topics are now explained, uh, in my opinion, pretty clearly. So this would be the first place to look if you're new to uh, crash cushion design and it should handle all your situations. So it explains the location call out, which we've just gone through. The length of need process, which basically directs you to if you're using guardrail, uh, see the guardrail length of need tool. If you're using concrete barrier, see the concrete barrier length of need tool. Uh, test level selection uh, based on design speed. System width. Length of end treatment. Uh, the default value, as we said, is 27 foot, 6 inches. And now constrained conditions. If you don't have that space, constrained conditions, which we won't get too deep into today, but we have some clear explanations in the SPI of how to handle if you don't have all that space needed for a crash cushion, there's multiple ways to reduce that space. And then you put it in the table for the contractor to see that they have a, a length restriction. Uh, temporary crash cushions, just where to look uh, for more information. And then we have a, a, a little portion for alternative crash cushion uses. If you're not connecting to barrier ends, you're just trying to shield it from hazard, uh, we explain how to handle that. And so here are our new pay items. So we used to just have one simple pay item um, it wasn't really covering the needs or communicating as clearly as we wanted to to the contractor. So now uh, we went ahead and improved that. Uh, so that old 75 is gone. And now we basically got two pay items, 544-2 uh, for TL2, that aligns nicely for 45 miles per hour unless 544-3 for TL3, that's over 45 miles per hour. And then the one other choice you have to make is whether or not it's a narrow or wide system. So in the SPI Part D, it explains uh, for connecting the barriers, uh, 24 inches or less, you're basically using narrow. That standard is narrow. So the concrete barrier is two feet wide, guardrail is less. So that's, that's narrow. And then wide would be something kind of extra large, basically. Uh, so then you go ahead and pick the dash two. So that's the new pay item concept. And last but not least, uh, we have a kind of a simplified table uh, from what used to be there. And so I'll just step you through the briefly the things on the table. So location, it's defined in SPI part A, as we had mentioned, and right here. Uh, system width is defined in SPI part B. Uh, it's basically what happens with this now. Um, I guess uh, Candy was clever over there and uh, the, the, the CAD group and uh, realized that once you select your pay item, you're kind of by default selecting the test level and whether it's narrow or wide. And so once you do that, that's already taken care of. So then it will show up automatically in the pattern description. So if you use your DNC manager, um, you know, crash cushion with and test level is going to show up in the pattern description. So you don't have to input that. And so same thing, crash test level is going to automatically show up for you. And then so barrier width, uh, it's defined in SPI part D. Uh, if you're connecting, for example, concrete medium barrier, uh, you go ahead and call that out, go to line, you go to line, 24 inch barrier width. So that would be where that goes. And then last but not least, uh, length restriction. Um, like I said, we have some good explanation uh, to explain what happens when your default crash cushion length of 27 foot 6 inches uh, just simply doesn't fit for, for project constraints. Uh, we have a couple different methods where you can bring that number down. And then what happens is you're going to want to choose a number that allows the contractor to pick at least a couple crash cushions off the APL, but they may be shorter than 27 to 6 inches. You input that value as a length restriction, and then that takes care of, uh, that, that, takes care of that for you. And so with that, I think um, there was handling questions uh, real time on there. This is Ed Cashman, Standard Plans Engineer with the Roadway Design Office. Um, as Derwood mentioned earlier, the, I'm going to mention the more what I consider the more significant changes to the standard plans. Um, this is not all inclusive. 
So I'm going to be talking about the temporary traffic control signal signing and pavement marking indexes and lighting indexes. So to kick it off here, we're going to be talking about the temporary traffic control. For 102600, which is the general information for traffic control through work zones, one of the one of the changes in this index is that we did increase the the maximum lane closure length to three miles for high speed facilities. This was previously two miles with with um, an exception for rumble striping. On on sheet nine, the the drop off condition note uh, number five there has has changed. It's a, it's a little more limited now as far as its usage. Um, so it's, it was somewhat unrestricted before. Now it's an isolated drop-off condition less than 100 feet in length that is created and restored within the same work period. Um, this, this note more applies or is applicable to really contractors and construction personnel. Moving on here to traffic pacing, index 102-655. Some of these, these notes have been removed here. Um, this is partially to allow the usage of traffic pacing if necessary and cases other than uh, limited access. So this is this is the updated sheet here. Also, there there is a new note here, number six, which is really meant for vehicles being moved, large vehicles being moved across the work zone for uh, a close a time period of less than a couple minutes. So this is removing some of the the required um, devices. Uh, moving on here into signal signing and pavement marking indexes. The the first index here is index 654, rectangular rapid flashing beacon assemblies. This index was previously in, or I, I should. I should say this sheet was previously in index 700-120. This has been broken out into its own index now. Um, most of this information just carried over from index 700-120. The more, probably the most significant change here is that this the height requirement is seven feet to the bottom of the sign, the the assembly itself. Um, special sign details, index 700-102. The, the only changes in this index were a few signs that were removed. So here on sheet five of 11, um, the school day time Duration signs have been removed. On sheet 10 of 11, these, these, um, let the reverse curve signs, those have been removed. There, there are standard details in the, um, the MUTCD and standard signs book from FHWA regarding these signs. Tourist oriented directional signs. This is this was index 700 103. This index has been deleted and the details have been moved into FDM 230.2.10. This was primarily information for design and it didn't really belong necessarily in the standard plans. The the post and such are covered by the the other indexes that we already have. 
Traffic Control for Street Terminations, Index 700-109. Some of these um, extraneous notes have been removed. That wasn't necessarily the, the kicker for what started the revisions to this index. That was mostly to remove any illusion that there was only one wind beam necessary for the uh, object markers. So this is this is now the the updated index, and we included the two wind beams in here. Also, some of these signs have been rearranged a little bit. So that's just something to keep in mind. Um, enhanced Highway Signing Assemblies, Index 700-120. So there were there were quite a number of changes to this index. So I'm just going to be highlighting the, the most significant ones here. One is that we did change the the title of the index to Enhanced Highway Signing Assemblies. This was previously um, referred to, I believe, as uh, Roadside Flashing Beacons. The, as, as I previously mentioned, our RFBs have been moved to the separate index 654-001. We also have introduced an alphanumerical system for easy identification of the, the different sign assemblies that we have. So um, if it were to be called for in the plans, you would be referring to the, for instance, uh, type A1, if it was a, um, a warning sign with the the um, so the conventional power here. Also, there there has highlighted signs are now available in some of the assemblies that are shown in the index. Um, that's primarily for for school zone situations. Also, the use of pedestals for all roadside signs, that's consistent now across the index that we're showing the, the pedestals. Typical placement of RPMs, index 706-001. There were only a handful of changes here. It's primarily related to the the optional details that we have available the and it's in regard to the where to place the RPMs and the reflective yellow paint so i removed some RPMs from the the median island situation also the the yellow paint has been removed from the median island. The, um, I, w I would call it the pork chop there. The pork chop has also had a couple of changes as well. Sheet five of six. This is a new sheet here. And this was previously shown in the FDM. It's in regard to the placement of RPMs at limited access crossovers. Um, this was just to eliminate any potential need for um, details that aren't really necessary in the plan, especially when this is a kind of a typical installation. Another new sheet in this index is the placement of blue RPMs. This is for the fire hydrants. This information is still shown in the TEM section 4.3, but that might potentially change in the future. Pavement marking index 711-001. So some of the changes that we made to this index, um, 
There are standard details for route shields now. And there are some associated notes to go along with that. The pavement message spacing table is new. That is replacing the, the standard across the board spacing of the 25 feet. Sheet 9 of 13. Um, the only real change on this sheet is that the, the S value from sheet 1 in the pavement message spacing table has been added here. Sheet 10 of 13. This sheet was showing a lot of intersection details, but what we really wanted to get across was the actual details of the crosswalks. And there was some, there were some misconceptions about when this could be applied to cases other than intersections. So this, this sheet will now just show basic crosswalk pavement marking details. Also, I moved note three here to sheet seven of 13. This is for the extension of the double yellow center lines. So this is, this is now showing the new sheet where it's just the details of the crosswalk being shown. Sheet 11 of 13. Uh, once again, this is this is in regard to the uh, pavement message spacing table. Some of the values in here have been replaced by the S from sheet one. Old sheet 12 of 14. This was duplicated information. Um, index 509-070 already housed some of this information. So a few of these notes have migrated over there, but for the most part, um, there were no real changes here. This is just um, the, the railroad crossing, pavement marking and signing. Uh, same as always, it's just in the other index entirely now. Moving on to the lighting indexes. The only real change here is index 715002, which is the standard aluminum lighting for the conventional. There were quite a few changes here. Um, I'm just going to be highlighting the significant ones on sheet two of eight. A lot of these, um, dimensions that were shown in here weren't really necessary and have been condensed down. Also, some of this, this information in here, such as the, the fill height, was really applicable to designers and not contractors. So it has been moved into the SPI. Um, also, as I mentioned here on the left, the, the values of tables that have changed or disappeared have been really kind of reworked into the details of the details shown in this index. So if you're missing a value, just look closer at the, the details. So this is the new sheet here showing some reduced clutter. Um, sheet four of eight. The the biggest change here is that the the pole wall thicknesses have been revised. So the um, other than that, most of this information is the same, or it's it's more consistent now. And that's it. Um, if you have any questions. Please let me know. Okay. This is the structures portion of the standard plans update training. 
for the new book. We will be covering the standard fare of changes, uh, a little bit of this, a little of that, editorial changes, minor, major, standard plans, followed by the SPI and cell revisions, and a little on the developmental standards. Uh, this training, like Ed said with his, does not include all the changes. This will just highlight some of the more interesting ones, some of the more, the ones that may have affect you more. The standard plans along with the SPIs are in two separate lists in numerical order and I've had some questions on this lately. The, uh, the trick to this is first to get into the right section. If it's on a bridge, go to the bridge section. If it's roadway, go to the roadway section. Then think of your specification, like 521 covers concrete barriers and traffic railings. So if it's on a bridge, go to the bridge section to the 521. And there are two items that are not obvious as to their locations. One's walls, all the walls are in roadway section. And box culverts, regardless of the size, are in the bridge section. To review changes to an index, Derwood went over some of the, S the revision log but this is different in that it is totally in numerical order. That it is not separated by structures and roadway. Now last year we introduced the standard plans packager tool to assist in bundling the standard plans for the structure set. And this year we've made a little change. We've added a selection that you do by the let date that will choose the proper year to be inserted into your plan set. Okay, we're going to, oh, editorial changes. We've made a lot of little editorial changes. Most of them were the standard, there's a change from barriers to traffic railings. Last year we tried to define that more clearly, and this year we just went through and cleaned up some of the things we missed. Other editorial changes are just typos or spelling errors. Some of these will be in the revision log, but typos and spelling errors, we just kind of fix them and move on quite often. With all the changes last year, changing the standard plans and the renumbering, we made a few little misses. Uh, one was that we missed that the storage facility number, phone number had changed. So pay attention to that if you're using the temporary detour bridges. Um, additionally, uh, let's see, on concrete I-beams, the correct notes were on the sheet, but some of the references were incorrect, so we fixed those. And a note was added to this release regarding holes in the beam webs for temporary bracing or shipping devices. These holes must be formed prior to casting, as always, and past practice would require all holes to be filled. Now, if they meet the listed criteria, the holes may remain open. And due to multiple questions on the jacking forces required for the concrete sheet piles for CFRP, the jacking force was added to the to index 455-440, and we also added to uh, 455-400 just for clarity. And the designer information section modulus and free stress losses was moved to the SPI. For request from construction, a note was added to index 521-512 and 521-610 to clarify how the asphalt on top of the junction slab is to be paid. The variable thickness asphalt is structural overbuild. 
Now, in the last update, we removed parts of the barrier delineator notes that were covered by the specifications and inadvertently lost part noting the color to use for these delineators. So those have been added back. Uh, index 521-620, note 7 was added to reference the bullet rail, and note 8, which was copied from in other indexes about the end transition uh, to make way for the bolting. And the change was made in the width of the bar 5U1 in index 521-630. It, before we said it was variable width, but that bar was a set distance, set space length. And we have changed that to formally account for that variability. Now this I debated on whether it was a minor or major. What we've done per request from contractors is we basically added a bar that is an upside down version of the 4P1 that was used. The open top was always because we knew we'd be drilling into the top to put anchor bolts for the bullet rails. So this is a option that they can the contractor can use, and it's up to him to space it so that he doesn't burn up his drill bits trying to put the bullet rail in. It was a real tight index, had a lot of stuff, so we've added another page just to clean it up and make this more clear. Now, an errata was added earlier this year to for the outer cast pile for the noise for the perimeter walls to match the noise walls. And the other minor change we made was just a clarification to the conduit detail in 630.010. It seemed to indicate you could only use it for double, but you can also use it for triple conduits. Now, on to major revisions. This is one that will only affect those doing the uh, post-tension bridges, the segmental bridges, and we added a pocket to help do, assist with the inspection and the threaded plug getting it into place before it was very tight and very difficult. Uh, also, went through the procedure notes and changed those, updated those to make them more clear. And the polyurethane top coating, which was in the specifications, has been added to the drawings to highlight that requirement for both super and substructure post-tensioning. Indexes for the traffic railing noise wall or concrete barrier noise walls have been reorganized. We tried to move all the notes to the first sheet and made some changes to notes. Just read them carefully, but the information hasn't really changed. And there have been multiple projects where alternate reinforcing details were added so they could be slip formed. So what we did was we looked at it again and changed the reinforcing to make it easier to slip form. We've put it into three sections, one for the foundation, one for the traffic railing or barrier, and one for the wall. That way, the railing or barrier portion can be slip form. Now, these do not change the concrete dimensions or the weight. Now, for off-bridge applications, the width of that foundation that it sits on can be increased at no additional cost to make slip forming easier because it only gives you half inches drawn. And we are aware of the more robust designs that have been out there that can be fully slip form, both the traffic railing and the wall. We decided at this point not to make them a standard, but they're out there and can be considered mostly for off-roadway, not for bridge use. Now, over the years, we've had a lot of requests on this one to make it uh, change to this pedestal 
so the pedestal could be poured at the same time as the deck, and the traffic railing could be slip formed. Now, the depth of the pedestal is required to resist the loads from the light pole. So the new option two maintains the top level of the concrete as a single pour instead of being raised up, and the bottom elevation is dropped. Now, this will make slip forming the traffic railing possible, but it might be difficult to form. This is detail is intended as a contractor option unless, in a very rare case, the elevation of the cantilever section is critical. Now, the use of FRP reinforcing for MSE walls no longer requires special permission. So we have added a section for the durability requirements for the FRP reinforcing to the index, 548.020. Now on to standard plan instruction changes. Now the notable ones on this is we've tried to add more clarification on box culverts as to what clarifying what goes where. And a small note was added to the Florida I-beam graphs noting that the camber in those graphs in the SPG, uh, SPI, may not meet the camber requirements and you need to check to make sure that those are met in all cases. And index 455, 400, and 440, precast concrete sheet pile had that section modulus that I mentioned earlier, and the pre-stress after uh, losses after pre-stress after losses information added from the standard plans because it's more of a designer issue than a contractor. And 521, 500. Concrete barrier noise walls were updated to allow up to three conduits in the barrier or the traffic railing section and slip forming information was added. Uh, 521-660, light pole pedestal bridge. We have added some requirements and loads to index 534-200. No for the anchor bolts to the pet light pole pedestal to the bridge. And on the noise walls, we've added information on alternate technical proposals, mostly to deal with the fact that some of the precasters have requested that we give you to use basalt or FRP reinforcing. And this gives them the method or the designer of the method to do this for the non-corrosive materials. Ah, the cell library. Please update your cells. We've only made two changes for this next update, uh, be in the next push, but they are also available on the website so you can always download the latest and greatest that way, but it's best to update that cell library anyway. The changes are minor. We just deleted some notes and updated. And now, the developmental standards. There have been, I think there was a uh, email sent out recently that the innovation website has been updated. We've added the ultra high performance concrete and we're working on all the developmental standards to update them to the new number series, new numbering and the Florida slab beams. We have had really a lot of them put out there. It is really a major success and we've had very little troubles. The contractors seem to love them. We're going to try to get out there and do some field inspections ourselves, and those may be moved to the standard plans next year. But we are also working on details for attaching exterior beam formwork and uh, some details for a link slab. Steve Nolan's been working on it. Now, we are here 
to do what we can for you. If you ever have a suggestion for new standard or improvement, we would love to hear from you. Preferably give us time to get it done. We had a lot come in right as we were finishing up this year and I couldn't implement them in time. But we are working on them and they'll be analyzed for next year. We do consider all ideas, but would much prefer some middles come early, not the last minute. And as most of you know, Steve Nolan has been kind of moved aside. He's, they're using his creative side and organizational skills to expand the use of non-corrosive and innovative materials. So I still pick his brains as necessary, but we're trying to free up his time for other endeavors. So I am the main contact for the standard plans, drawings for structures. You can email me any time or call about a questions on an index. And here's your team. Uh, we will all be glad to help you in any way we can. All right, thanks, Cheryl. Um, one thing that I did want to pull up real quick for everyone um, based on some questions we were seeing was where some of this information that was talked about, whether it be the standard plans, instructions, or the um, some of the cell library stuff, or some of the programs. And I believe you should all be able to see my screen with the web browser on it, yes. Okay, so on the standard plans website, like I said earlier, um, you can access the latest CAD files and cell libraries on the support web page. And what that'll do is just bring up a the website that contains all the DGNs and cells as, as long as there is one associated um, with that standard plan index. And so uh, we were trying to split a little bit of information out of the primary standard plans year web page so there wasn't quite as much information there so that's why this information is now located on a separate sheet but it's by year and so if you need some historical version of it it is still available in terms of the standard plans instructions and any associated design tools for example here with temporary barrier you'll see that the instructions or spis are located in this column and can be accessed there. And then if there's an associated design program, like Richard mentioned for length of need determination, the Excel program is listed as well. Um, and then there are a number of the indexes that the structures office oversees that have programs as well that might be MathCAD related. And that'll take you to a separate um, structures site that has those different programs available. And with that, I think we'll go ahead and wrap up for today. We were able to answer the majority of the questions added into the chat as we were going. And like Bobby said, initially, we will post that Q&A for everyone to see um, upon uh, posting the, the webinar in video format. And we'll also provide a copy of the PowerPoint presentation in PDF. Thank you, and have a good day.